So let me ask you this first off. How did you actually get started in the shark tracking business? Oh, boy, that's a long story. You know, I um, was working on the water, started in the late 90s, uh, began to help some scientists who were studying other species, you know, billfish and things. You know, and really started to see that the scientists, they didn't really have the funding of the boats or really the knowledge about how to catch fish. Um, but we needed them to collect data so they could publish papers so we could manage various species in the ocean. You can't change the future of the ocean on a fisherman's story, right? You need a peer-reviewed published paper. But a lot of the scientists don't know how to catch what they study or have the capacity to do so. So when we were going fishing anyway, we happened to be making TV shows at the time, we started taking scientists who studied whatever we'd be catching, depending upon what part of the world we were in, because it didn't cost us any more money to put the scientist on the boat. We would do what we had to do, let the scientists come and do their science, let the animal go, and then we were able to radically increase the rate at which the scientists could collect their data so that they then had enough data to publish a paper, which could then be leveraged for policy and management. While we were helping with these other species, many of the scientists began to talk about there was a major shark problem, and this is around 2006, 2007, down to about 10% of our large sharks, and they would say things like, if we lose our large sharks, these fish that you're helping us study, they won't be here, because the sharks are the balance keepers. They prevent the second tier of the food chain from running amok and wiping out all the fish we need to grow up. And so at the time, I was just like, wow, I didn't really know sharks were that important. You know, we're, I'm not a shark guy. I, mean, I grew up chasing fish and frogs around the woods of Kentucky. I said, let's manage them back. They said they're so big, we can't study them. We don't know where they mate. We don't know where they give birth. The, the tools that they had, they could poke into the animal, but it didn't give them enough data to solve the puzzle of their animal so that they had a big enough data set to actually manage the large sharks back. Where were they mating? Where were they giving birth? What's the full migratory range? They just didn't have that data, and that was kind of the cornerstone of data required to start moving the system back toward abundance. They are the lion, the wolf of the ocean, the balance keeper. And um, I said... You know, Spanish and back, they said they're too big. We've not been able to study them. We don't have the data to do so. And I was like, well, you just said no big sharks, no fish sandwiches for my grandkids. And like, yeah? Yeah. I said, well, I guess we better do that. And so we pivoted around 2008 to taking everything that we'd learned to try to uh, help scientists catch and build capacity so we can, like on search here, we give them the ship. Because they don't have any money to pay for the ship. And then we have a crew of guys led by Captain Brett McBride that can actually go capture these giant animals and bring them back and give them safe access to a big collaborative team, which is different than the traditional approach. And uh, that's what has allowed us to accelerate the rate of learning that we have is by bringing fishermen and scientists together around a ship and boats and have the capacity to move the needle on these areas we couldn't have previously. So when did you actually get a hold of the ship? I bought the ship in 2007. So were you fishing other species at that point? So we were doing this show called Offshore Adventures, which was on ESPN Outdoors. It was about fishing and free diving. And um, we had been doing that for a long time. It was back before the Internet. You know, we watched TV on Saturday and Sunday mornings right. uh, about the outdoors. And um, we had been doing that for about eight years, and that's when we pivoted. So we were wrapping up the end of that, and that's when we began kind of pivoting toward exploration and research really we felt like the ocean had given us so much that we just wanted to spend the balance of our days trying to give back to make sure our kids right. could see an ocean like we're seeing that we're enjoying and really try to balance our relationship with her so yeah we pivoted 2007 and 2009 is when they took place you know it's always been about these larger animals are where all the scientists are stuck and so it was all about creating that safe access to these larger apex predators that were critical for the future. I mean, 37 expeditions. We've got over 30 published papers. We've got another 30 coming. We've been, we cracked the code. We've learned more in the last seven years about white sharks, maybe, than everything previous to that time. And still learning. And still learning, and the rate of learning is increasing because yeah. we have more and more scientists. You've got to realize, most of these scientists out there, they're working in their individual silo trying to get ahead of other scientists. Right. And they're not collaborating, and they're not sharing. And here, because we, the way we fund it, we give the ship and we have the guys to capture the animal for them, we open the ship to everyone. So on our North Atlantic white shark team right now, we have 30 scientists from 20 institutions doing 20 different research projects on every single animal we capture. Yeah. You know, the old way and the way you see in other places is like, you know, one guy is going out in his lab catching one shark doing one or two projects. 
and well, then keeping the data. And then so. not sharing the data, right? So we open source it to bring the public in. We have this collaboration, so we're maximizing the learning around every animal we touch so we can solve the life history puzzle of that animal in that region, touching the fewest amount of animals. That's right. You know, because we're learning so much from everyone versus these individuals are doing one thing and you, know, you really want then you got to do 20 things to figure out each animal. Well, then instead of learning 20 things from one animal, you got to go catch 20 animals learning one thing from each, right? That's not shark first. Right. That's not ocean first. And so uh, if we're different, you know, we're about being efficient and getting it done for our grandkids. We don't care who gets the credit. Uh, and we just want to make sure that we're proud of the planet we leave behind for our kids. And the only way to do that is going to be to collaborate and open source. So what do you think the biggest threat facing sharks is today? Uh, the biggest threat outside of the United States would be finning. We're winning in the United States. Our, our shark populations are recovering off the east and west coast of the United States. The system's moving in the right direction. I think we're the model for the world, really. Um, but when you get outside the United States, it's finning. And then there's also, as we kind of deplete the resources of the ocean, there's more and more of these countries that are having to go to shark meat for food, which is, was something they never would have done before because it's undesirable. And right. also, there's so much mercury in a lot of these sharks, it's actually very, very bad for human health. Um, so actual shark fish meat markets are increasing as they can't catch any more tuna or any more snapper or any more mahi. In those sorts because, they're of things. Overfished. because they're overfished and, and when you get outside the states. And so they just start kind of catching and eating whatever they can. Yeah. So now, I know that we talk a lot about sharks being at the top of the food chain. If you don't have sharks, you start losing these other species. What happens to the sharks when you lose the other species, like in those cases? Well, if you have the sharks, you won't lose the other species, okay. right? So it's if you lose the sharks, the system collapses. You know, the way it works in an area like this, we're off the southeastern United States right now. You lose your sharks, the squid explode in numbers. And then every night when they migrate to the surface, they eat all the baby mahi, all the baby tuna, all the baby snapper, all the baby cobia, everything. Yeah, because the fry out there in the ocean, there's nowhere to hide. And so then we don't have any fish to grow up for us to eat. And when you're up in the northeast United States or over in Atlantic Canada here, anywhere where there's seals, pinnipeds, you know, when white sharks are present, they feed one-fourth as much each day when the white sharks are in the area than if the white sharks are not. So if there's no white sharks, they're feeding four times more on everything in the water than if the white sharks are there. So they'll wipe out the lobster, the cod, the stripers, the mackerel, everything. Everything. Yeah, when the white shark's there, they sit on the beach until they're almost starving, and then they get out, get a little bit to eat in the ocean, and then they get right back out of the water because they might get eaten. Yeah. If the white shark's not there, it's just an all-you-can-eat buffet, and they just go wipe it out. Okay. So the, the, the presence of the large sharks is actually more important than what they eat. So, yeah, the sharks eat some squid. They eat some seals, right? But the presence of the sharks keeps the squid down because the squid knows the shark is there, and it might eat them. The presence of the shark keeps the seal on the beach, Right, And yeah, they eat a few seals, but one shark can keep a whole seal colony pinned on the beach. Yeah. Right? They refuse to go down. And if that shark's not there, that whole colony is in the water over foraging and wiping out the resource. Yeah. Simply destroying everything. Yeah. So what would you say to any aspiring young fisherman, shark researcher, scientist? What recommendations would you give to them? The biggest thing I tell a lot of young up-and-coming scientists now is make sure you study some communications courses and some content courses. Understand how to tell people what you're doing, why it matters, and how they can help. Because we see a lot in, the, in that space when we deal with scientists and researchers. Some of them aren't great communicators, right? And we're moving into an era where content is king, connectivity is all around us, and he or she who can communicate about their science as what they're doing and why it matters, how they got started, why they got started, the communicators are going to win moving forward because we're just moving into this era of total connectivity, content, and communication. And so uh, that's the biggest tip I, I tell people that are that are, you know, if I'm going to study marine biology, do you have any ideas? you got to understand some content. you got to be able to tell people about what you're doing. Um, otherwise, you can be the greatest scientist in the world, and nobody's going to find you. I got you. Okay. Well, kind of final question here. What do you think is going on in the Gulf of Mexico? For the second shark now, we had Catherine in, what, 2005 or something like that. She went up there into the Gulf, and now I think we've got four up there right now. Una Maquis up there. Helen is over there. 
something. I mean, they're getting way up. Into the yeah, angle. something's going on, right? The sharks are showing us a new piece of the puzzle that we need to get our head around. Yeah. Um, you know, this is the time of year we believe that they're moving around foraging, right? Our science is evolving, right? And I have access to things that aren't published yet because I'm getting early indications from the scientists about what they're finding. Our most recent findings about where we thought they might be mating look to be incorrect. And so I, I don't believe that mating has started yet. I think that they're foraging, you know, around down here. Uh, in the, between, you know, Cape Hatteras, most of them in the northwest Atlantic, between Cape Hatteras and Cape Canaveral, Florida, and then Cape Hatteras is in North Carolina, in this large area along the southeastern coast. But then suddenly we tagged 16 or 17 sharks up in Canada in the last two years, and then this year now we got four or five sharks in the Gulf of Mexico. We used to just kind of have one odd straggler, like, that's weird. Yeah, and they wouldn't even go that far. Yeah, and they wouldn't, the right. They would just kind of go around. Not many of them would go up there by Panama City in that area north of Tampa. And um, suddenly this year we got four or five of them over there. So I think the Canadian sharks are showing us something a little different than the uh, kind of northeastern United States sharks or the Massachusetts white shark. Yeah. Um, and I think as we get more data, time will tell. And then we'll see if it's worth making an expedition over there. An expedition over there is going to be brutal because they're all like 100 miles offshore. Yeah. And so you basically got to go out there and get pounded in the weather and then fish whenever you get a couple nice days and then get pounded and then get lucky enough to be on top of one in a very fast area with not a lot of data. So I think that Probably if we continue to tag more sharks and they begin to give us more indication about a place where you might actually have a chance of finding one if you went there – we would consider it, but right now we just don't have the data set to, you know, each one of these trips is 500, 600 grand, right? So yeah. you want to try to use it as efficiently as you can to get the, the sharks. You've got to get the sharks in different areas. Otherwise, you're just getting the same data set over and over and over again, right? right? So you can't solve this puzzle just by working in Massachusetts or just by working in Nova Scotia or just by working here off the southeastern United States. It's the same body of sharks moving around. But when you capture and sample those sharks, because we do so much research and get their full physiological profile, mm -hmm. we're seeing how different that profile is. Like we know the blood work of the females down here is much different than the blood work of the females when they're up in the northeast. Same with the males. Yeah. We're seeing different hormone levels down here than we see up there. Right. We're seeing much different diets up there than down here, which makes a lot of sense. You know, they're eating seals up there, a lot of fish and squid down here. Um, so you have to, in order to solve the puzzle and nail down birthing, mating, foraging, you have to move to these areas, even though when you know you come on a trip like this right here, where we'll come out for 22 to 25 days, and we're hoping just to get one. Yeah. But that data set of that one male or female allows you to compare and contrast it to the full data set you have from both Massachusetts and from Canada to see how are their hormones different, how is their diet different. That can help you zero in on where they're mating and what's going on. With everything. Yeah. You can't solve these puzzles if you just work in one spot. Yeah. So that's why it's going to be important to try to get to the Gulf one day if we think we have any sort of chance of capturing even just one. But we need to track, you know, like 20 or 30 sharks over there, see how they move around to try to pick that where do you go. Yeah, what's going on there. And where do you go? Yeah, and when do that. you go? You know? A lot of people like you're looking at a big zoomed out man. They're like, oh man, they look right there. Just go out there, and you know, you zoom in on it. It's like a 500 mile circle. You yeah. know, <laughs> it's just a dot on a map when you're zoomed out. Uh, when you get in there, it is an enormous. The ocean is so vast, it's hard for a lot of people who don't spend time on it to. Uh, we did the Gulf. Yeah, no, we did the Gulf of Mexico, but that was different. That was tiger sharks and mako sharks off of oil rigs out of okay. Texas. Trying to understand how those sharks are moving from rig to rig because each one of those rigs has a priceless artificial reef under it. So there's tons of life. And then we did some southwest Florida work way back in the day. Uh, but we've never done any white shark work over there. So is it something that you have to be set up differently for white shark? Because I, I remember last time on this trip, you were able to you know, tag a tiger and then had a great white. So Yeah, we had four white sharks here last year. It's really just about weather windows. You can see, like, it's wintertime in the North Atlantic. And so you don't get a lot of good weather days. And these animals are moving around offshore on various wrecks and reefs. And so you can only go out there when you have good weather. Yeah. Well, in a 22-day trip, if we get 8 to 10 days of good weather, we're pretty stoked. And then you got to be on the right wreck and get the right flyby. Yeah, uh, so it's really hard, right? It's really hard. But the data set is worth it. The 
most important sharks I think we've caught in the North Atlantic research puzzle that come from this area, right? When we started in 12, we tagged a couple of sharks, Mary Lee and Jeannie the first year, and then Catherine the next year, and Betsy. And those sharks came down here, and so we came down here, caught a shark named Lydia. She never went back to Massachusetts. She went to Canada. We kept that going. The next time we came down, we caught the shark Hilton right here off Hilton Head. He went to Canada, not Massachusetts. These sharks off the southeastern United States led us to Canada. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't have gone there. Then we follow their tracks and go up there, and we find lots of sharks. I think there's a lot more sharks in Canada than there are in Massachusetts. If there's hundreds in Massachusetts, I think there's thousands up there. We, we didn't know. Yeah. So that's why you got to follow the sharks, capture the animals in a different area. Lo and behold, you captured a shark that wasn't a Massachusetts shark. Canada's on the radar, right? Then you go to Canada, you find lots of sharks. Yeah. Wouldn't have happened without having the determination to come down to this part of the world knowing you may get no sharks or you might get one shark. And one shark is you make the whole expedition. And so when you're when you're exploring and you're trying to crack the code on a two, three hundred million year old puzzle, mm -hmm. it's not going to be easy, right? Otherwise, yeah. it'd have been done. And I think one of the things that OSEARCH has that because we all have worked on the water for so long and are watermen is that you know we have no problem knowing that we're going to go out for 25 days at sea. Half of those days, we're going to have to hide on the inside because the weather's so bad, and then we're going to go out for the other 10, 12 days, and maybe we'll get one chance to get that fish. Like, we're up for that. Most people can't imagine investing in that, right? You know, because we know how the ocean works. We know how hard it is. We know what that data set could reveal for us. And so it allows us to get these data sets and help these scientists learn things they could probably never otherwise get funding to try to achieve fishing not catching that's right you know it's <laughs> tough if it was easy it'd have been done a long time ago i mean there's been people studying these sharks for 40 or 50 years and you know since 2012 we've had an enormous breakthrough